Well, good evening, church. How about this? Life's not fair. I think at some point of our life, that's a statement that we've all heard, we've all said. You know, if you're a parent, I think we have all heard from our kids, life's not fair. She got the bigger bowl of ice cream. Life's not fair. He gets to stay up later. Many of you guys know I coach soccer, and I I hear the it's not fair all the time. It's not fair. He gets more playing time. It's not fair. They get to be forward and score all the goals. And that's just from the parents that I hear that. But, but adults are not immune from this it's not fair mentality, right? It's not fair. She got the promotion and I didn't. It's not fair. They have the nicer car. It's not fair. They have the bigger house. And it goes on and on and on. You know, when, when, I, when I think of those words, it's not fair, I remember back to my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Huggins, and he always said, fair is a place in Texas where they throw cow chips for distance. <laughs> now, fair's coming up in a couple weeks here in Grants Pass, but, but that's not the point. Fairness is something I think we all, at some point, we strive for. Or, 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 we, or we covet that idea that, that I want to be treated fairly. And maybe, maybe it's not always that, that we, we are being treated fairly, but maybe we're the ones treating others fairly. So as we go on tonight, first of all, let's look at what does that word fair mean? You know, fair itself, when you look at the, the other synonyms for fair is just, equitable, honest, Upright, honorable, trustworthy, unbiased. When we, when we think of that word fair, we usually think of equal or even. That, that we want equal distribution of, of something to all the people who are involved. Which means that, that we want everyone to have the same thing in the same amount. And usually that thing should be good. Being treated fairly is so much on the forefront of our minds. It's not fair. So what happens when we come across those times in our life when we're not treated fairly? If you're like me, usually we complain. Usually we find someone to hear about how our life's not fair. And, and as we look at our passage today in this series in Genesis and through our legacy uh, series, that's the point and that's what I continually saw as I studied, this idea that life's not fair. And for me, it was super hard because I read through chapter 31 of Genesis and I kept seeing all these grumbling and complaining and whining. And I said, how am I supposed to teach that? Life's not fair fair. But the good thing is, and our big idea today is this, and it's the title, is when life's not fair, God's still faithful. When life's not fair, God's still faithful. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in in Genesis chapter 31. Um, If not, if you don't have one, you can use the the one in the pew back in front of you, or it'll be up on the screen most of the passages I go through. Um, we're not going to read all of chapter 31 because you know how it goes. Um, we'll be here all night. And uh, I know that you know, some people need to go have dinner. I do. That would be great. Um, but, but when we look at this idea of life's not fair, we're going to see it happen in the lives of almost every character in this study. They all come with this idea that life's not fair for them. So if we start off Genesis chapter 31, and it doesn't take long to see the whining start. Verse 1. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. So the first thing we see is that life's not fair from Laban's sons. They're the first ones that are whining and complaining. 
Oh, Jacob, he's taking everything our father owned. He's got all of his wealth. I mean, is this not like sibling rivalry at its best? Now, now Laban's sons, brother-in-laws to Jacob. So they're saying, well, well, Jacob took it all. It's not fair. And I think it's interesting there. It says that Jacob heard Laban's son saying. I don't think he actually heard him saying it. I think it came from another outside source. I think someone overheard Laban's sons whining and complaining, and guess what? It got back to Jacob. Because so many times we don't really go to the person who's been unfair to us. We tell everybody else first. We tell anybody who will listen, look at how unfair my life is. That gossip that goes on and on and on. So Laban's sons do that. They complain about, man, he took all the wealth and he took everything our father's own. Now, now I think it's probably not an understatement to say that they were exaggerating a little bit. Don't we usually do that when we think a life's not fair? We, we, we look at our plight, we look at all the things we've gone through, and we just embellish it a little bit so that when, when people hear it sounds better and they get on our side quicker. Taking everything our father's owned, and gain all this wealth from what belonged to our father. So Laban's sons cry out, it's not fair. We go on and we see that it's not fair as the next people comes from is from Rachel and Leah. Jump down with me to verse 14. It says, then Rachel and Leah replied, do we still have any share in the inheritance of our father's estate? Does he not regard us as foreigners? Not only has he sold us, but he has used up what he paid for us. Surely all the wealth that God took away from our father belongs to us and our children. Wow. Wine, wine, wine. Here they are, and and, and they're talking to Jacob. So both of their wives, both of his wives come together. I know that was all weird from last week. But Rachel and Leah, they begin to share in their grievances against their father. You know, one probably started and then like, yeah. And the other one gets on board, yeah. They're, they're complaining about their father being unjust and unkind. And the first thing they talk about is, do we still have a share in the inheritance? Do we still get the money? How many times does it's not fair deal with us financially? Then, then they go in and say, it's not fair. Are we foreigners? See, see does, does dad think that we're strangers now? Like he doesn't even treat us the same way as his daughters. Life's not fair. It says that he sold us and used up what he's paid for us. Now, I don't know, he's talking to Jacob, and that's got to be a weird conversation when Jacob's, yeah, he sold you to me and all the stuff. But then it says that he used up the dowry, right? He's already used it up. He squandered it all, and they're complaining about it not being fair because there's nothing left for them. They focus on the problems. They focus on all the things that have gone wrong. And, and, and like I said before, they kind of get each other going. They get on each other's side. And, and once they have someone that's sided with them, they're like, yeah. And they build and they build and they build. And so many times that's us. I work with students. And that drama that happens when one person begins to the, the, the cycle of unfairness and then somebody else jumps on and then they else jump on. Now it's, it's spread like wildfire. Misery loves company. Life's not fair for me. Come on board. We'll go together. So Rachel and Leah are are against their father together, against Laban together. And check out what they do as a result. Go back to there in verse 16. Pick up there. So do whatever God has told you. Then Jacob put his children and his wives on camels, and he drove all his livestock ahead of him, along with the goods that he had accumulated in Padam Aram, to the father Isaac in the land of Canaan. When Laban got had gone to shear his sheep. Rachel stole her father's household gods. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban, the Armenian, by not telling him he was running away. So he fled with all he had, crossed the Euphrates River, and headed for the hill country of Gilead. So what happens? They complain, they whine, and then they leave. 
And that's usually something that we do when we get in a place of injustice, when we get in a place where we don't think it's fair, we just get up and go. We don't want to stick around. So they leave and they get ahead and, and, and then we get to the next belly acre, and that's Laban. Laban starts in on his whining, it's not fair. So he chases Jacob, it says he chases Jacob and his family for seven days. In verse 26, we pick up where he's caught him. Then Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You deceived me and you carried off my daughters like captives in war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me so I could send you away with joy and singing to the music of timbrels and harps? You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You have done a foolish thing. It's not fair. Laban cries out, you've deceived me, you lied to me. You took my children and my grandchildren. I think it's funny that Laban is so disgruntled because when we've seen the story of Laban, we know that it's, it's kind of a taste of his own medicine because he kind of has been the deceiver. He deceived Jacob and, and did the whole bait and switch thing with, with Rachel and Leah, you know, like, hey, work for seven years and you'll get my daughter. And then it's the wrong daughter, so work another seven. Like, that's who Laban has been, but now it's on the other foot. Now it's against him. Now he's the one that's on the other side of the unfairness. And I think that's really good. We're, we're really good at pointing out unfairness when it's others to us, but when you point that somebody else is unfair, there's usually a few fingers pointing back at you. So Laban cries out, it's not fair. It's not fair. All the thing you've done to me, Jacob. You took my daughters. You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren. Laban's sons cry out, it's not fair. Rachel and Leah cry out, it's not fair. Laban cries out, it's not fair. Well, since everybody's in and everyone's crying out, Jacob joins the pity party, right? Jacob in Genesis 31, verse 36, we get to see what he has to say. Jacob was angry. Jacob was angry, okay? So he's angry. He's a little, he's a little, he's a little perturbed at all the things that are going on. He says, what is my crime? He asked Laban. How have I wronged you that you hunt me down now that you've searched through all my goods and have found nothing that belongs, what have you found that belongs to your household? Put it here in front of me and your relatives and mine and let them judge between the two of us. What is my crime? How have I wronged you? Come on, let me hear it. And he continues. Here's the, it's the big, the, it's not fair part. Verse 38. I have been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and your goats have not miscarried, nor have eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself. And you demanded payment for me whatever was stolen by day or by night. This is my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime, the cold at night, and sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for 20 years. I was in your household. I worked 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times. Jacob, do you want some cheese with your wine? It's not fair. He cries out all these things. It's not fair. I've been here for 20 years. And during that time, hey, all your sheep and goats, they were great. They didn't miscarry. I haven't eaten any rams from your flocks. I didn't bring you animals torn by wild beasts. Instead, I bore the loss myself. I worked 14 years for your daughters. I worked six years for your flocks. And during that time, you changed my wages 10 times. Now, I'm not saying that we want to justify this for, for Laban at all. But he complains, life's not fair. Jacob, he kind of gets the same thing, right? He, he runs into the same problem that Laban did. He kind of gets what he deserved. He, first of all, he runs up into his own match in Laban. You know, Laban deceives Jacob. 
He cheated, he deceived, he used him for all the things that Laban needed. But if we link, think back into Jacob's life, Jacob was a little bit of a cheater, kind of a deceiver. Hmm, deceived his brother, cheated his father. He's been that. He has been the one who wasn't fair, and now he's in the other end, and he's complaining. We'll actually see in a couple of weeks that, that Isaac and Jacob, they, they get to have their little run-in coming up. But, but right now, he's just complaining. See, so he wants to, to just complain about the actions because it takes the attention off all the things that he's done wrong. Right? He's in this place. He's grumbling against Laban for all that he done, so he takes the attention off of all the bad things that Jacob's done. He plays the victim. He plays the martyr. He says, it's not fair. It's everyone else's problem. Doesn't that happen a lot in our society today? That too often we don't take responsibility for the role that we play in the unfairness. We don't take responsibility. It's always everyone else's fault. Complaining, grumbling, and whining. It's not Now, if we stopped right there, what a bummer of a message, right? But the big idea was when life's not fair, God's still faithful. God is here in the midst of all the grumbling and complaining. God is always there in the midst of our grumbling and complaining. So we see some cool pictures of what God does in the midst of everyone's it's not fair statements. God shows up in so many ways. So we're gonna look at a couple of those pictures. Uh, The first one is that God faithfully speaks. We see that in Genesis 31, uh, three different times. uh, he, He speaks to Jacob and he speaks to Laban. The first time he speaks to Jacob, it says in verse three, then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. In verse 11, it says, The angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, I answered, Here I am. And he said, Look up and see that all the male goats mating with the flocks, they are streaked, speckled, and spotted. For I have seen that all Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel. You are, the, you are anointed a pillar that you have made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. God speaks to Jacob. He guides them back to his native land, to his hometown. But Laban also gets to hear from God. God speaks faithfully to him. He says, Then God came to Laban in a dream at night and said, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. God spoke to Jacob. God spoke to Laban in a way that would guide them for the rest of their their journeys. He wanted them to go back to their native land. He wanted Laban to, to not say anything good or bad against Jacob. God was faithfully speaking, and they both faithfully listened. When we face times of unfaithfulness, it's fair to say that that we should stop and listen to a faithful God as he speaks to us. He will guide and direct us. So God faithfully speaks, but he also faithfully stays. In verses four and five, it says this, Jacob sent word to Rachel and Leah, come out to the fields where his flocks were. He said to them, I see that your father's attitude toward me is not what it was before, but the God of my father has been with me. He has been with me. God faithfully stayed with Jacob through it all. In the midst of all the complaining about fairness, in the midst of 20 years of work and labor, He knows that God never left him. Deuteronomy 31.6 says this, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For you know that the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. The Lord your God stays. Faithfully stays. And check it out. Be strong because God stays with you. Be courageous because God stays with you. Do not be afraid or terrified because God stays with you. 
The Lord your God goes with you and he will never leave you or forsake you. God faithfully stays. He also faithfully protects. We see that in verse 6. Jacob says, You know that I worked for your father with all my strength. Yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages ten times. However, God has not allowed him to harm me. God was watching out for Jacob the whole time. And he faithfully protected him the whole time. He says it protected him from harm. That word harm there means to, to literally break into pieces. Physically, socially, morally, to bring evil, to do harm, mischief, punish. All that time of unfairness, God never allowed Laban to harm Jacob. And finally, we see that God faithfully witnesses. The end of the chapter, starting at verse 43, it says this. Laban answered Jacob, the women are my daughters, the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks. All you see is mine. Yet what can I do today about these daughters of mine or about the children that have, they, they have born? Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as a witness between us. So Jacob took the stone and set, it a, set up a pillar. He said to his relatives, gather some stones. So they took some stones and piled them in a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jagar Shahadutha, and Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. That is why is it called Galid. It was also called Mizpah because he, he said, may the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are away from each other. If you mistreat my daughters or if you take any wives besides my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember that God is a witness between you and me. Laban also said to Jacob, here is this heap and here is this pillar that I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness and this pillar is a witness that I will not go past this heap to your side to harm you and you will not go past this heap and pillar to my side to harm me. May the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of, the, of their father judge between us. So Jacob took an oath in the name of the fear of his father Isaac. He offered a sacrifice there on the hill country and invited his relatives to a meal. After they'd eaten, they spent the night there. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and daughters and blessed them. Then he left and returned home. God is the witness of the restoration between Jacob and Laban. They, they decide to make this covenant and God is there to witness. God is there to see the changed lives of both of them. They were able to make up and put the past behind them and they worked it out as God was the witness and God would be the one, one to remember. God was faithfully there. When life's not fair, God is faithful. So what does that mean for us today? First of all, we need to realize that we will have times in our life when things won't be fair. I know it's not a popular thing to say, but it's the truth. We can't, we can't live in this messed up world and expect messed up people to always feed us, treat us fairly. God won't always take away, take away the unfairness, but he will always help us endure and be victorious. God will be faithful to speak to us, to guide us, to protect us, and always be there with us. I said that the God doesn't always guarantee that we will not be treated unfairly. Now, that may seem a little unfair. And, and, and this next statement, it may surprise you, and I've been wrestling it with myself as I prepared this, but, but I want to tell you this, that God isn't fair. God is faithful, but God's not fair. Yeah, that's what I said. God is faithful, but God's not fair. Now, now before you send me emails and hate mail, actually my email, if you want to send it, is tgoins at River Valley CC. Um, but, but let me unpack this statement that God's not fair. God's not fair in how he deals 
with us. And not only is God not fair in how he deals with us, but I don't want him to be fair in how he deals with us. You might ask, what are you trying to say? It's the context that we look at in, in getting what we deserve. See, it's all about fairness. And if we think that, that we want fairness to happen, fairness from, from God, then we have to get what we deserve. And I don't know about you, but I know that what I deserve is punishment and death. And instead of getting what we deserve, God has given us a whole lot more. He was perfectly, if he was perfectly fair with, fair with us, we'd all experience this death and punishment. But if you look at, at Psalms 103, and it'll be up on the screen, verses 8 through 10, it says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, he, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. The Lord shows compassion and grace. He is slow to anger, abounding in love. And, and verse 10, he does not treat us as our sins deserve. Our sins deserve punishment and death. And if he treated us fairly, we would have to endure that punishment and death. So instead of treating us fairly, God has showed us mercy and grace. Mercy, that idea that, that we're not getting what we deserve. Instead of doing the fair thing and giving us what we deserve, what we deserve God responds with mercy. Mercy. He also responds with grace. Grace, that unmerited favor of God towards us. Getting what we don't deserve. He gave us a gift. A gift that we remembered through communion. The gift of his son, Jesus Christ. The gift that God gave that rescued us from that punishment and death from our sins. That unmerited love is a gift from God that we cannot earn. We cannot work hard enough. We can't work the 14 years and the six years to get the gift of grace on our own. It has to come from God. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 says it this way, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. By grace, you have been saved. It's not fair, but I don't want it to be. Grace is something that starts and ends with God. It's a gift that he gave through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you've never received that gift, if you've never taken the time to say, I don't want what I deserve, I don't want the fairness, I want Jesus Come and talk to someone tonight. We'll be up here as the prayer team. We would love to pray with you and have you find that gift. Thank God for that gift of Jesus. Thank God for not being fair with us and how he deals with our sin. Thank God for his grace and his mercy. And thank God that through, every, through everything, that we deal with, through everything in this life, that God will always be faithful. Let me leave you with this last verse. Deuteronomy 7, verse 9 says this. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant to love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Thank you for always being a faithful God. When life's not fair, God is always faithful. Let's pray.
God, we thank you so much that you are a faithful God. That in the midst of what we consider as as unfair life, you chose to give us your son to die on the cross for us. God, I thank you that you don't deal with us fairly, but instead you offer us grace and mercy. Father, I pray for those here tonight who who are just uh, maybe understanding that for the first time. God, would you have them make a decision to follow you tonight, to, to accept that gift of grace that we can't earn on our own. And God, we thank you for for those things that right now in our lives that we're going through that may seem unjust. God, would you just remind us that you are faithful. Amen.